work it and work it and work it. And it ends up in the right spot on the left foot of Stephen Hill. Michael Walters. And it's down his talent. He loved the strike. What about this for a move from Stephen Hill? Time to steady. Watch out for Clark to fly oh! over the top. He's getting better and better every week. What about this catch? Zach Clark, huge leap over Jake Spencer. Barlow had a moment, but Ballantyne had a longer one. Hello and welcome to episode 15 of the Frio Big Footy podcast. This week we'll be reviewing the game against Melbourne where Fremantle bounced back to form on the MCG with a thorough comprehensive beating of Melbourne. We'll also uh, have a look at the team selections for the upcoming game against Port Adelaide in our probably our big test before the final series starts. And uh, also just maybe have a look at the sub situation and uh, our final side going in with only a couple of weeks to go. Joining us this week, as usual, is our resident uh, expert from Victoria in Seppo. How are you, mate? Great to be back on once again for episode 15. I can't believe we've actually done 15 of these now. Time's flying along. We've only got two more games of the home away season to go. So looking forward to it. And once again, joining us from his uh, earliest stint in the year and fantastic to have him back on board is uh, Jedi Mind Tricks. How are you, mate? Yeah, well, thanks. Um, thanks for having me on. And uh, I feel like the, the rookie amongst the veterans at the moment. No, not at all. <laughs> no, no, so it's terrific to have you on board. And uh, obviously last week uh, we saw Fremantle... Uh, sort of come up with a comprehensive victory, win, kicking 20 goals, 13, 133 to Melbourne, five goals, 838. So a 95 point win to Fremantle and obviously did a, a good job for their percentage. And uh, I think probably the most pleasing thing for uh, Ross Lyon would be the fact they had two goalless quarters. Uh, and even though we sort of had that second quarter fade out a little bit, um, the fact that, you know, keeping aside goals for two quarters would have been a Probably a pretty big tick for him. What did you think of the game, Seppo, being there? Um, well, it was a good thing being there, but it was um, terrible, the crowd. Just to be there, it almost seemed like a ghost town at the MCG with um, only 13,000 there. And I reckon a good 3,000 of that would have been for our supporters. Our bay wasn't obviously full, but still on our section of the ground, there was a heap of purple out there. And even speaking to a couple of Melbourne supporters in the office on Monday, that they said they had some Freo supporters right around the other side of the ground and in the stands and members. So, um, yeah, really disappointing from Melbourne side of view. But um, it was a bit bit of rain. It sort of came and went and was uncomfortable in the stands, but made up for it with the performance we had and the amount of goals, just the ball flying over our head in that last quarter was um, great to see. Uh, there's something I like about um, Freo. I don't know if they mean to do it, but kicking towards our cheer squad in the last quarter seemed to... Um, bring them home and from our point of view we love it and it was uh, great to see you know Pav finding form late in that game and um, kicking as many goals we did and chasing down that percentage to make it a nice competitive race with Sydney. Absolutely and uh, Jedi what did you think of the game mate? Oh absolutely loved it, sat down with my family, watched it, we cheered them on. Um, most pleasing thing for me was no matter how far up we were we still chased so hard Fremantle into the back line, stopped their goal. They could have easily snuck a couple more through Melbourne, but just a running fence, not just offensive goal shooting. It was, it was a complete game, regardless of whether we were playing Melbourne or any other team. It was fantastic. And I think, uh, as you said, I think it was, a, you know, once again, we got a pretty good spread of players and both Mundy, Pierce and Lockie Neal continuing his form, good form with all over 30 possessions. And probably, as I said, Mundy hasn't probably looked his normal self, I thought, a couple of weeks before that, but bounced back to his best on the weekend. Barlow with 28 possessions and Hill with 25, who probably would have, uh, his eyes lit up with the fact that he was playing that loose man uh, in defence there, which is something he probably hasn't enjoyed much of over the last two years. So the fact he got a um, that uh, freedom was probably just something he enjoyed and probably just took him a while to get used to. Two uh, probably unfortunate parts of the day were the injuries to... Aaron Sandland, who had a fractured cheekbone, and but looks like he'll be okay for finals. And Hayden Ballantyne as well, who uh, just did his shoulder right in the last probably couple of minutes of the game, which is a bit disappointing. But once again, he looks like he'll be right to go and train reasonably well during the week. The other probably highlight was uh, Lee Spur kicking his first goal for Fremantle. <laughs> and uh, he certainly uh, celebrated like it was his first goal, which was terrific to see. Not as good as um, Grimer's from North Melbourne. I had a look at the footage of that and his post-game interview. I'm not sure if you guys have seen that, but it's worthwhile viewing if you haven't already just to see um, someone that's played a heap more games than what Spur has, but it's great to get him finally on the board. 
um, and kick a goal. And, and when, when you mentioned before, um, Centurions about Hill, it was amazing to see his eyes light up and, and almost you could see him think, hold on, I can beat these guys and take them on in the midfield. And that goal he scored was brilliant. Quite he just burned them off. And, um, and then he got carried away. I think it happened in the third um, where he went through the midfield and, and got a bit too cocky and, and went ahead and actually um, went too far without bouncing. So it's been a while since I've seen one of those paid, but good to see him want to take the game on. And boy, didn't he look good going through the midfield. And one that was mentioned on the form and was um, a bit of a toast to Sheridan, who looked really smooth with the ball and actually ran pretty well, ran the lines, um, got behind the ball and, and helped carry it out at, at some stages, obviously through his rotation. So that was actually good to see as well. Yeah, I think there's been some talk, obviously, and I mean, there's been also on a bit of the draft and trading forums with uh, talk about Sheridan wanting to go home, but uh, I'm a big rap for him, and um, obviously Jedi Mind Tricks, you would have seen him a bit down at Peel this year, but I just think he... Absolutely. And I just think in the next uh, couple of years, once he gets a bit of bulk on him, and uh, I think he's just going to be one of those elite outside uh, wingers for us, and uh, I think his ball he, use is sensational. He, he really impressed me. He, he did impress me at Peel. He... For me, he's played a little bit second fiddle to Mitchie, but having said that, he's taken the opportunity, probably didn't get a lot of the ball when he first started off playing for Fremantle. However, you know, the last couple of weeks, he's really showing what he's worth. It's good to start giving these guys who are our first draft picks um, game time. We were relying a little bit on Sutcliffe and Neil, some of the later draft picks, but someone like Sheridan, you know, really starting to come to the fore now and hopefully or well, he may or may not make finals but I think he's definitely setting himself up for a good season next season. Yeah, and he's he's even stringing games together now. So he's he's been in the side, he's um been named on the interchange, so I'm not sure if it means he's um at risk of a late change or maybe getting the vest, but we've got Sutcliffe there, so more than likely that will happen. But it's just great to see him as a almost a project player to um, take over the mantle from Monday probably because he, he seems most um, – it was probably even the podcast we had you on Jedi early in the year when we are talking mm. about all the players from Peel and I made the comparison from um, Sheridan being the project player to cause, you know, give him a couple of years once he starts to bulk up, but he looks like to be able to take over Monday's role in the midfield. That's right. So he, he, he's playing alongside him now, which is a great way to learn a skill and trade, but, um, yeah, I reckon he, it's a good sign to know that we've got – um, these guys playing and being able to cover. And I think that's right. Yeah, sorry, go. sorry. You go, oh, Jedi. One, oh, thank you. Uh, that's one thing. Ross has definitely played the young guys, and the the fantastic thing about um, Sheraton getting game time right now is if some of those injuries didn't occur, and I would love us to field our best 22 each week, we wouldn't have seen much Sheraton this year, and it would have probably stunted his growth a little bit when it comes to AFL. However, Game time's now, and in three years, I don't know how long Monday's going to be there for, hopefully three, four, maybe even more years, but by the time he um, finally holds up his boots, players such as Sheridan Sutcliffe should just be able to slip seamlessly in there and really control games and not have to worry about some of the veterans of the team week in, week out, such as Monday and Barlow, for instance, being able to control themselves. Yeah, and I think also the, uh, you know, in the, you know, even in the uh, East Fremantle team, you know, with Josh Simpson, who's going to, you know, he's probably a couple of years off, but he'll just sort of be that ready-made replacement for the pace through the middle as well. Like, I know a lot of people probably haven't seen him that much, and obviously he's got a few other sort of issues going on at the moment, but if he gets himself back like uh, Mickey Walters does, I think a lot of people are going to be really surprised at how good he can be as a, uh, as a um, not only an inside player, but also an outside player. You know, he's just, you know, anyone seen him at under-18 level will really um, know what, you know, what sort of potential he does have. So hopefully we'll see that in the next coming years as well. Zach mm, I agree. Sorry, I just, I've seen uh, him play about three games this season and he's got all the skills in the world, elite skills. I know that gets kind of overused sometimes, but he really does. It's just a matter of him being able to find the ball a little bit more and getting his confidence up and maybe dealing with some problems he may or may not have, I'm not too sure. But, yeah, once once he actually gets some games behind him and gets his confidence up, you know, he, he definitely has the potential to be a good AFL player. Yeah. And the other player who sort of probably hit his straps this year in terms of making his mark is um, 
Zach Clark, who once again had another cracking game, especially after we lost Sandlands early in the game. Clark sort of, I mean, granted, we were probably going up against a couple of other younger players, but he's just his ability to not only uh, ruck him, but get possessions around the ground and be that link-up player but, and kick goals as well. In the last couple of weeks, he's kicked a couple of goals from uh, 50 and uh, just sort of getting better and better every week. It's funny to see um, sort of my little knock on him at the start of the year was his ability to take those big grabs and, and be out-muscled in the contest. And this year, his highlight packages are, are full of um, winning great ruck taps in the centre and around the ground, not getting out-muscled, and then sticking those marks when he has ventured forward or around the ground and being that option out. Like, I remember watching it twice, probably in the the, the Melbourne game and even two weeks earlier in the Richmond game, how... Clark was that get out option from the the defender kick out straight out to the fifty, and Clark jumped up a couple of times and took a nice clean grab. And it's great to see him really sort of showing us fans and obviously the coaching staff what he's actually capable of. So um, he's one of the better ruckmans that are under the age of what twenty five at the moment. I think in the comp, he's he's right up there, and Absolutely. he's pretty much now overtaken Sandy's role as number one ruck. So. Well, it gives um, Santa Lambs less time having to run, cover the whole field, which is great for him, which, you know, preserves his AFL career for, for a longer period of time. And we really need Santa Lambs right now, uh, just like we need Zach Clark help because of um, Griffin going down. And I had grave concerns when Griffin did go down as to if Clark could step up. But ever since he stepped up, it hasn't just been for one game a la Sydney Swans where I thought he had a pretty good game. He's just been consistent and I've got full credit to um, that Clark and he's held himself up this season. It's been fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. All right, any other points you want to make, Seppo or Jedi, before we uh, move on? No, you can find. Well, good. It's been one of these uh, selections. All right, so looking at team selections this week, obviously uh, Fremantle have had... They've made two changes this week. Aaron Sandlins is out with a cheekbone injury and... Probably to the surprise of some, Alex Silvani has been omitted um, with Jack Hanneth coming in to replace Sandlands, which is a pretty obvious uh, swap there to give uh, Clark a little bit of uh, ruck relief. And uh, Cameron Sutcliffe has also made his uh, return to the side. While for Port Adelaide, Jack, Jake Need, Kane Mitchell and Sam... Cocoon, it's pronounced. Yep. Calcoon comes in, and Nathan Blee has been admitted, along with Hamish Hartlett suspended and Cameron Hitchcock with the hamstring. And Zach Clark is playing his 50th game this week, so fantastic uh, achievement for Zach, and uh, obviously, hopefully, the first of uh, many sort of milestones for uh, Fremantle. But uh, I would still probably, for myself, be surprised to see Ballantyne line up on the day, and wouldn't be surprised at all if Silvani makes his way back into that 22 come game day. So, particularly... What about those other two emergencies? There's um, Hayden Crozier and yep. the old Jesse Crichton sitting there. So, oh, sorry, yeah. mate, I, was, I was leaving that for you. I know how much you oh. wanted to uh, pump up just, his tyres. Just, just have to cover them, look at the full possibilities. And I know we've been the master of late changes this year, so there's every chance. And, and it is funny, but then you look at the, the way um, a, lot, a lot of people questioning Silvani's omission, um, but the way we sort of lined up with Dawson and Johnson, and Johnson has played that sort of centre half back role and even though he's not the best one on one and better played loose, um, we've got to compete against uh Westhoff and um Jay Schultz this week. So not the most damaging tall forwards, even though you've got to watch um Justin West Westhoff with his um unco arms go everywhere. It could be a, a bit of an injury risk, so we've got to protect our players there a bit. Um it will be interesting to see how that back six lined up. Um, and if there is a, a late change, because we've really got to be able to match up well, not against their tools, but it's their smalls that will worry me. And uh, hopefully, if there is a chance for Crichton to come in and show his wares, um, take out one of their small forwards. They've got Wingard, Monfries, Need, and even Robbie Gray up there, considering uh, a medium or a small. is um, a lot of work for the other guys to watch out. Yeah, and I think, uh, as you said, the, I mean, the other option, obvious option would be Hayden Crozier coming in for Ballantyne if he does, uh, doesn't does get up. He just sort of like for like in that forward line there. So, as you said, it'll be interesting to see because obviously probably Johnson matches up pretty well with Westhoff. They're very sort of similar type um, players. So, as you said, probably just looking at more of the matchups and whether Silvani does give that option. So, with Hannah down the front, what do you think of the changes this week, Jedi? Uh, I think they're really good. I'll 
disappointed not to see Silvani in the team, but if you think about the team balance, although Silvani didn't, I think, been playing quite well, they have quite a small forward line and kind of highlighted by you guys before, we probably don't need to go too top heavy in the back line. Um, we need pace. They're quick. They're small. Uh, Chip Chad Wingard's absolutely killing it. Montfrey's been playing fantastic. Jake Nan is very quick. Robbie Gray's also a great player. You know, there are concerns there, and if someone like Silvani can't match the pace of them, then it doesn't matter how tall you are. You've got to be able to keep up with your opponents. And I think Ross has actually chosen a team that really can um, counter-attack their players in the forward line. So I think that's fantastic. I think that was something that uh, sort of Lyon intimated during the week, that they basically picked their side based on the opposition first. And I think maybe, the, as you said, the Silvani omission could be due to that. It'll certainly be an um, interesting game, particularly with the uh, you know, lose, the loss of Hamish Hartler will hurt them a little bit because he has been a pretty solid midfielder this year for them. But uh, Kane Mitchell will probably be like looking forward to his homecoming as well. He's uh, played mm. many a good game on uh, Subiaco Oval or Patterson's and uh, does like the open space and he'll run all day. So... It might we'll give him a... the vest, though. He's been the vest for them a couple of times, yeah, so, so more than likely, he, unless they use Need or one of their smaller X-Factor guys to come on, but um, it'll probably be the way that one of those guys are used for their sub. Yeah, I think it'll, as you said, it probably wouldn't surprise you at all if Mitchell's the sub for Port and Sutcliffe is the sub for Freo <laughs> based, on, based on experience. So, uh, But just looking at the game itself, obviously one of the sort of success stories for Port this year has also been the uh, in the ruck as well with Matthew Lobb. Um, just been killing it in the hitouts in the last few weeks, and he nearly had, nearly got close to fifty, I think, or over fifty the other week. So oh, wow! Clark will have his um, game cut out for him this week in the ruck. And obviously, it's true. And they've got um, obviously we've got Hannah and Clark, and really when you look at other than Lob there. Um, I don't know who else they really use for in the ruck. If it's West off for pinch hitting or um, Trengrove or Schultz in there as well, but. Um, I, th- I think Clark at least can handle him, even though Lobb's been doing pretty well. It's um, going to be a nice challenge for him. Absolutely. I think Clark's up for, the, for it. Jack Hannes has been rocking really well for people, getting a huge amount of what he um, is getting the ball around the ground, and that could be a little bit problematic for Fremantle. However, you know, looking at our midfield, I think we can cover that. It's just a matter of being able to, you know, change low with the um, ruck taps. And if you can do that, even go 50-50 with him while that class is getting rested, you know, break even there, I think um, we'll still have the upper hand. I think the, uh, obviously, as you said, the Ch- Chad Wingard's been uh, tearing it up. I think the probably the concern for Port will be how their small defenders in Jonas, Heath and O'Shea go against, Bal- if Ballantyne does play on Walters. I think that... Uh, and even Chax and Trengrove is not really an ideal matchup for it doesn't probably for Maine either. I mean Trengrove's a fantastic centre half back, but he's probably better against those more power fours and Maine will probably just work him up and down the ground. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, Carlisle's an obvious matchup for Pavlich. Um, and uh, I'm sure Ballantyne after giving um, Carlisle tweeted him or was it him before when he was sort of gave him a bit of a stick, or was it him or Crowley when he was sort of and I think it was when Scarlett punched uh, Valentine in the face. Carlisle gave him a bit of stick on Twitter. So I'm sure he'll probably give him a bit back when he, uh, if he gets out there on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to that. And the good thing is about the actual game then is um, it's going to be good conditions. It's going to be, I think, 24 and sunny on um, Saturday night in Perth. And um, the other thing leading into this game is we'll know the result earlier from the Sydney-Geelong uh, game. So... I'm not sure if it'll have a real effect on the players or, or what happens or if there will be any late changes, but um, it'll be interesting to see what um, Sydney and Geelong result will be when we, by the time we start our game. Yeah. Do you think the uh, Do you think Crowley will go to Boke in this game? Oh, he'd have to. There wouldn't be anyone else really worthy of um, tagging through the midfield. So. Yeah, I mean, although some guys, like Brad Ebert's probably had a reasonable season, but you'd have to think, and Ollie Wines is probably that sort of in an underplay, you'd have to think that, Boke will be Crowley's uh, first choice. And where, who do you think Kane Corns will go to? Because obviously he'll probably play that sort of negating type role for Port, you would think, even though, and he's had a pretty good season after the pretty crappy year last year. 
I'm interested if they send him to five because I haven't known who Kane Corn really goes with. Well, it's more like the the Barlow or Mundy type runner. But it'd be interesting if they try and tag Fife and if we do put Fife on the ball if he actually goes for him or if Corns tries to work off trailing get the chop out to Boak to because without Hartler they're really going to need um, someone like Boak in there working hard for them so it'd be interesting to see how they use him and then they'll have to tag um, Hill as well well you'd expect them to so then someone else will have to step up and, and tag Hill and I'm not too sure who could do that so I thought well probably Kane Corns wouldn't be quick enough for Hill that's their concern I think they might be able to to Monday, but unlike other teams who can stop hills sometimes, really can't see um, Port being able to do that. I think Port's midfield this year has probably been improved, but as you said, they probably don't run deep as deep as Fremantle do. And even if uh, Corns does go to Fife, you'd have to imagine Fife would probably take him forward a little bit. Or even if it even if he goes to Barlow, because I think he's, they definitely have an edge over overhead in the forward line if they uh, if they. So do if they do tag him, I think they'll just drag him forward a little bit and try and expose him um, in that forward 50 just with overhead marking. And we've seen in the last probably pretty much all season really, Fife and Barlow do tend to rotate through that forward line a little bit when they're not playing on ball and are able to take those marks inside 50. Mm-hmm. So any other uh, any other points or matchups that you uh, think about for this week or? Well, the other thing for Port is they're going to be a, a very strong finishing team. Uh, I've just had a look at the amount of fourth quarters they've won. They've actually won 15, while we've only won 12. So I've only watched a, a couple of Port games this year, and some of them have been absolute crackers the way they've stormed time. So we obviously can't be complacent. And um, like I say, I haven't watched too many of them. So there are some players that will be um, interested to see how they go, like um, that Thomas Jonas, um, Aaron Young, um, Kai Coon. And uh, there's one or two other names I didn't really recognise too much, and it'll be interesting to see how uh, some of those lesser light players um, match up against us and on the big stage, and and how much we can actually do to to start get a win, and even just help push our percentage uh, further up. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the Adelaide. Oh, sorry. No, you go, mate. If you look at the Adelaide um, Port Adelaide game a few weeks ago, uh, Port Adelaide actually looked like they were going to go down in my workbooks. They the last ten minutes they just absolutely turned it on. Could have easily laid down and kicked about four of the last five and and won the game. They are, they have been finishing incredibly strong, no doubt. Of yeah, and I think like you said even before you were talking, Seppo, about guys, you know, like Andrew Moore is another one who you could probably fit in that category of, you know, the, not knowing a lot about. So it'll certainly be. Um, you know, different when you look at compared to Port teams of old, but you know they're certainly going in the right direction. And obviously, full credit to Hinkley and the coaching staff over there. I mean, at the start of the year, you'll probably, you know, if you said Port were going to finish ahead of teams like West Coast, Adelaide, and Carlton, you probably would have uh, <laughs> probably scoffed at them. So I mean, full credit to them. But the re- reality is, they've got to win at least one of their next two games to uh, cement that spot in the eight. Um, the rest, you know, the sort of drug thing. A sigh, which I'm not going to talk about at all, but it seems we've got enough of that. But um, yeah, so I mean, they'll certainly come out all guns blazing. But you know, as you said, Frio's still, particularly if that Sydney get over the top of Geelong, they've got plenty to play for themselves. All right. So also this, uh, before we get to the tips this week, we're sort of uh, just having a bit of a discussion about the uh, in the podcast about the stats, or particularly with the subs this year. So uh, Seppo, do you want to? Uh, Elaborate a little bit further on that. Yeah, I just want to sort of cover off on um, as we get closer to the finals, everyone's having a lot of discussions. I know this has been a heap of threads up on our um, best 22 going into finals and how we're trying to squeeze all these guys in. And, and we've got a lot of guys to come back, um, like McFarlane and, and Ibo, depending on his Achilles and Clancy and, and some others that still make – Make make the side we're playing at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see. You know, we've played Sutcliffe now as a substitute um, nine out of the fourteen games he's played this year, um, and he's selected and again and he's every chance to be the sub again. It'll be interesting to get your thoughts, guys, on when we say if we make a prelim or we get to the grand final. Would you prefer someone like Sutcliffe that has been trained and moulded into this um, sort of X factor gut running? Um, impact as a sub or would by chance he would be naturally falling out of the side and we'd have to squeeze someone like Subin or 
albeit Neil, if if Lockie Neil's been performing for a spot in there, how you'd actually want to use the sub going to finals? What's your what's your thoughts on that, guys? You can go first, Jedi. Okay, I, I for one um, would the way Nick Subban's been playing really, to be the sub because of his gut run, his hardness for the ball. I think some of the things that he does on the ground, although he might not be one of our A-grade players, he um, can bring a lot to the game for us. And you know, a couple of great goals or an excellent run-down tackle really gets the guys pumped up. I would much rather, uh, uh, if we get our strongest 22 uh, or thereabouts, if Lockie Neal become the subs. When he comes on, he's in the accumulator. He can get a lot of the ball in, say, the fourth quarter, 10, 15 possessions, maybe, and that can help us out. Um, I'd rather see Spike Subban play a full game, or if Sutcliffe has been playing well enough as the sub, most weeks, not all, but most weeks he has, I believe that. Or I'd rather see him as a sub than someone like Subin. Yeah, mm. I I tend to agree with what you're saying about um, Subin. I think Subin, and I think Subin's certainly done enough in the last since he got dropped for that game. I think it was in round nine before half time against Hawthorne. I'm pretty sure it was. He's um, he's sort of made every stamp a winner. I can't see him dropping the 22. The only thing I probably about Lockie Neal is he's apart from as you said, apart from the fact he does accumulate, he has an uncanny ability to kick goals from stoppages. And when you're talking mm. finals footy, getting you know just having someone who can kick a goal out of nothing can change the momentum of the game is sometimes a critical thing. And I think for that reason, I, I'd be surprised if Neil doesn't hold his spot in the in the starting sort of 21. Um, but as you said, it comes down to injuries and who's available. I mean, you'd have to think at this stage, McFarlane would definitely be walk up start 22. Ibo would be a walk up start 22. I mean, Clancy, and maybe Clancy Pierce as well. Yeah, I thought Clancy. I mean, Clancy's had a terrific season, but you know, I mean, when you look at the other guys who you're going to drop for him, once again, it comes down to matchups. I think, and he's probably he's probably the most um, iffy in the side um, in terms of out of those three. I think um, whether he could hold his spot or not. I mean, some people would say, and if you look at who's in there and who would drop out of the side that we've got this week, I mean, who would you? Uh, which would be your first three to go out, um, Seppo? Well, when you look at the, the youngest kids, you've got Sutcliffe, Crozier, and Sheridan, and Neil. Hold on, we've got – no, it's not Crozier. We've got yeah. Sh- Sher- Sheridan, Neil, and Sutcliffe all Sheridan. in there. So they'd naturally be the um, three to make make way, but I think there's a space for one of them, um, providing Clancy or Ibo doesn't come back up for finals. But like I said, there's a lot of water to pass under the bridge between now and finals, and anything could happen. But at least those – Younger guys have had games this games this year. That's going to be an important thing. It's going to be hard to introduce someone else that hasn't really had time um, and knows the game plan. So um, it, it's going to be very hard to pick it from now. Um, but the thing is, you want someone that at least can stand up against the bigger, harder bodies in contested footy because you know that's what's going to be there against the likes of Geelong, Hawthorne, and Sydney in the last few weeks of finals. Yeah, and I think it'll. Um I think probably even this week's game will probably be a pretty defining type game for probably Matt DeBoer as well in terms of, like, he's that defensive forward and, you know, Ross Lyon loves the job he does on those guys. And, you know, you wouldn't... You probably have to think in some regards, you know, the way he uh, works, it'd be interesting to see how, uh, you know, what role he plays this week because they don't really have a, you know, with those sort of... There's no standout matchup for him down back. You know, it's really Pittard. Of... Pittard's probably the only one that um, mm. moves the ball well or Trengo for them off the halfback. Yeah. So DeBoer will probably go to one of those. Um, but I think DeBoer needs to do a little bit more to um, you know, help set up some teammates and um, even get on the scoreboard himself. So if he can do that, he's um, yeah. Yeah, definitely but he guaranteed does, best 22. He does actually take a lot of marks and he does give a lot of those sort of little um, outlet you know, forwards. The amount of times he pops up and just takes a little grab outside 50 or just manages to uh, give them an, another option, he is pretty important in the way they structure up. So I think he, I think personally he is safe, but I mean, I know a lot of posters are probably um, would have him in, in the possibly in the gun as well. So Because, I mean, you, when you look at our front six, I mean, Barlow, Main, Pavlich, Walters and Ballantyne, they're, they're the walk-ups. And then you've got Subin, Crowley, Mundy are pretty close. Hill, Johnson. Mazunga is another one who's probably, um, you know, some 
some people may question at times, but um, I think his last probably six weeks has been really pretty good. So, and I mean, Spur, Dawson and Duffield pretty much picked themselves. So it'll certainly be tough. I wouldn't want to be on the match committee, that's for sure. There's, which is a, you know, a great thing to have. So we, you know, in the past, we were probably never this blessed for uh, spots. Yeah, it's great to actually have this depth. So when people are going down, we've got the cover for it. Absolutely. So, and the sort of, uh, you know, and as you said, I mean, Sutcliffe seems to have more impact when he comes on as a sub, and I've always felt that. Than, uh, and I think Sher like a player like Sheridan seems to go better as the game goes on, where Sutcliffe seems to come on and have some sort of more in instant impact, you know, his ability to run hard. Uh, where, as you said, Sheridan just seems to um, accumulate more through the game. So it'll be interesting to see which way the match committee goes with it, that's for sure. So... Mm. All right, well, just anything else we want to add about the uh, subs or in the final side before we uh, wrap it up? No. No, I'm done. Okay, so this week, obviously, Fremantle are pretty warm favourites with a uh, fourteen on the head-to-head uh, -head and Port Adelaide a five seventy five, which is not a bad price considering, you know, their side. Obviously, they've got a bit of a chance there. And Fremantle have got the uh, at the Lions at 33.5 points. Uh so obviously a lot will probably depend upon the uh, Geelong and uh, Sydney game, depending on um, that regards. But also at the same time, it'll be interesting to see what happens if Geelong do win this week, because you can't see them losing to Brisbane the week after, whether Fremantle would want to play Geelong first up or whether they prefer to play Hawthorne. I would have to think they would be busting to stay third in just to uh, to get to third, because I think playing Geelong, which would have to think would be at Eddie had, would be a much better draw for us than trying to play Hawthorne at the uh, G. Oh, definitely, and to do that, all we'd need to do in that situation would really just be staying on top of um, City percentage. So, But the only thing is we, we can't really dictate terms with this game and, and hope to blow them out of the park like we have the last two weeks. So um, that line around 33 is probably my tipping margin. I'm going to sort of go for about 33, 35 points for us. I think it's going to be um, a sort of a slow start like we've done all year and then blow them away or, and, and they might claw back. So we might get out to about a 50 or 60 point lead, but I think Port have the capabilities, especially with it, what, how they've named their side to get some quick goals and might cut it back, but I don't think we're going to flog them. I don't think they'll beat us, but it'll be around that, that 30, 35 point for, for our win. What do you think, uh, Jedi? I think about 23 to 30 points. I reckon it's going to be a close game. You can't fall second um, in Port Adelaide, even though they're just in the top eight. They play some really good football, um, and they'll play four quarters, unlike some of the other teams playing on the last. Yeah. And I think their side is built with a bit of speed in it as well. So, I mean, that weeks. extra pace could um, cause Fremantle a bit of problems. So... And it's been our weakness this year, like when Richmond and, and Geelong have really caught us, it's been with speed. So they're definitely named their, seat, um, named their side with um, trying to pick out our, our little weakness, even though it's um, going to be well covered. So, Yeah, and I, as you said, I think that four to five goal margin will probably be about right. Um, you know, because if Sydney do win this or lose this week to Geelong, they basically can't catch us because we'll go ahead of them, I think, on games anyway, if I remember correctly. So... I mean, that will pretty much lock us into third, which will obviously give us that... Um, then Geelong, you'd have to think, will end up second, which gives us that uh, first game on the road. Um, and then we'll sort of see how it goes from there. All right, just to wrap it up there, obviously last home game for Fremantle this week in the home and away season. Obviously we're looking forward to a finals game at Subi. But uh, thanks for joining us again this week. Just a reminder, you can get our uh, podcast on iTunes if you haven't already done so. But thanks again for joining us this week, Jodo Mind Tricks. Fantastic to have you back on board. Thank you. And we'll obviously hopefully uh, get you on again sometime in the future. And Seppo, thanks again for joining us, mate. No worries. Only a couple more to go, and hopefully we'll have something special lined up for one of the last podcasts of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Beauty. Absolutely. We might be able to uh, might have something special coming along there. And uh, oh, just one last quick question, Seppo, before we go. Did any uh, fans take up their D's amnesty uh, last week? No, well, we, it was funny to have one uh, Melbourne supporter that was sitting next to our cheer squad bay who was uh, donning his Melbourne gear. By the last quarter, he actually had a, a Frio scarf and hat on. So um, it seemed to work for a little conversion during the game. And um, uh, like I mentioned on Twitter, Pav did like the um, banner. He saw it during the game, came up to me and gave me the hat after the game. So I was pretty, pretty chuffed with that. So 
um, well done to the guys that are involved in creating that one. That was a beauty. Absolutely. And uh, all right, so thanks very much for that, guys, and we'll uh, see you again next week.